Welcome back to another episode of the Spiritual Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Mary Beth, and today I have a special guest, Shay Fairbanks. How are you doing today, Shay? I'm doing well, thanks. How are you? Great. Thank you so much for being on the show. Um, I know we're very like-minded, and I wanted to read your bio real quick, uh, your short bio here, and then we'll get right into it, right into it. You guys, Shay's a... Okay. Uh, Health and wellness, is, is that how you describe yourself, a health and wellness coach? I'd say like human performance specialist. Human performance but. specialist. Okay. Yeah. And I know I've seen so many of your um, videos and reels, and I just love everything that you have to say. And I was I got to have this guy on my show because he's really a thought leader in this area. So I'm excited that mm -hmm. you guys get to, to see him. Okay. So Shay Fairbanks is a passionate advocate for all areas of human performance. With a background in functional fitness, performance breathing, and sobriety, Shay has created his own massive transformation from childhood trauma and abuse to addiction and towards ultimately healing himself to achieve vitality. Shay has created a roadmap out of hell that he leads his clients to achieve optimal human performance and unlock their highest potential. He has firsthand experience with addiction and sobriety, with poor performance and peak performance. Shay is focused on helping others become 1% better every day in their lives and creating the life of their dreams. So Shay, I guess where we should start is maybe tell me a little bit about uh, your childhood. You mentioned here in your bio, there was some trauma and abuse. And I, I think we all know like that could definitely have been a factor that led to the addiction, right? Trauma totally. sometimes leads to addiction. We want to numb out, right? So tell me a little, whatever you want to tell me about that. Yeah. So I, my story kind of starts, they talk about in, in psychology, at least they talk about three or like big trauma, big T trauma or little T trauma. And I, I had three big T trauma moments all before the age of 16, which statistically would put me in a category to develop um, addictions or be in, be in jail or crime, like get into a life of crime and stuff like that. Now, I didn't get into the crime side of things, but I definitely, it led me into uh using alcohol and other substances when I was younger as a, uh, as an escape method to not have to endure the things to relive and experience the events that I did endure. So when I was three and four in that age range, I was sexually abused by a bus driver, uh, multiple times. It wasn't just the once. And, uh, so that was something that happened uh, back then. And I didn't, I didn't talk about it until I was at least 23, 24, 25 kind of area. How old it were you when it happened? Service. Three and four. Three and four. Okay. And so it. I don't have the, I don't have like the sharpest memory of it. I do have a memory of it occurring. Um, but more so from, and this is something I learned even this past year, I was in a retreat and the channel channeler that I was chatting to um, in our one-on-one -on -one session said that my soul in those experiences with the abuse, when that happened, my soul left my body and mm. the abuse happened to my physical body, but not to my soul. So it was not imprinted on my soul. Uh, so that was something that I have been told now, like obviously learning that at at 33, 34 is one thing and very different than say learning that um, kind of processing what happened when I was in my early twenties, when it first kind of came back around after the time I didn't tell anyone, I kind of stuffed it as far down into my memory as mm -hmm. I possibly could and kept it there until it resurfaced, obviously. And then, so moving from that first big T trauma moment, when I was eight years old, my father passed away unexpectedly before Christmas, a couple of days before Christmas. And so, and he was healthy, non-smoker, non-drinker, passed away having a, he had a heart attack while playing hockey. He came off the ice, sat down on the bench, heart attack, slumped over. That's it. And so 
And actually, today's his birthday. Uh, How old would he be today? He would be 62 today. Wow. So he was really young. Did he you already was, say his age? He was 35. 35. And yeah, your age so almost. Pretty much. Yeah. Next, this year, I will turn 35. So, um, so that was a shock, obviously, another big trauma moment. And yeah, big T. That was another moment that that's the one prob that I've probably processed the most because it, I think it impacts me the most, um, within a day to day. Now I don't think about him every single day, but obviously there are times like on today or, or the anniversary day of his passing that I think about him more. Um, but I don't look at, I don't look at his death as like this massive loss i guess i mean it is but it isn't at the same time it is also a great reminder to live every day to the fullest yeah and that's kind of the way that he lived life so if i take the biggest lesson i can from him is to go out and live every day to the fullest and live your dreams live out your dreams and uh and that kind of mentality of living your life to the fullest is kind of definitely what i've done in my coaching world business and kind of where I'm at now living, living that optimal human performance. And then, so to fast forward from eight, my mom remarried to, uh, another man a few years later. And that first stepfather, uh, would go on to physically, verbally, and psychologically abuse us, uh, myself and my younger brother in particular, um, as we were the two middle children and definitely looked on as looked at from, I, I believe his perspective of these are two people I can, you know, exert some control and some, mm. some dominance over. And so there was that aspect of it. I, you know, he, there was moments where his arguments with my mother would get pretty bad and, and it was usually in those moments that myself, my younger brother would step in and, and try and provoke him to turn his attention elsewhere. Now he wasn't a drinker really, like he drank a little bit, but he wasn't a big drinker. So it was literally coming from like a sober rage place. It wasn't, it wasn't, uh, taking a, taking a punch or something from a drunk. It was taking a punch from someone that knows what he's doing Yikes. and sober. So that happened kind of all those three events happened all before I was 16 and and then around I mean I I started doing the grief process counseling stuff with psychologists and whatnot and counselors from uh, my father's passing pretty much the next year like from age nine onwards and and so I've been doing that and I still work on all three of these things <laughs> it'll be something i work on probably for the rest of my life right, but right. having all three of those things happen before 16 i definitely used uh drugs and alcohol but it kind of always started with alcohol uh, i started drinking when i was around 12 mm -hmm. 12 13 and i drank until i was i quit when i was 31 so it was in that period where I drank the most, obviously, maybe not all through the high school years, but definitely as soon as I turned, you know, as soon as I graduated high school, I was going out five days a week, six days a week. And that yeah. was, that was what I did. I, I did partake in, in some other extracurricular substances at mm -hmm. uh, that time, cocaine mainly, but I'd stopped using all drugs in 2013 and it was just alcohol that was kind of like the main vice for myself just so alcohol I, just alcohol you <laughs> the know. one that it's, took me down the most <laughs> it's the one that i find that and i post about it today actually is is it's all that good one is all about addiction and and why why quit if you're not addicted and it's because if I had realized what I was doing back then when I wasn't in an act of addiction, mm -hmm. uh, I would have been able to, 
you know, that's the only regret I have about getting sober is that I didn't do it sooner. Exactly. And how long have you been sober then? So since three over three years. Yeah. So I met, I met four and a half years and, but I'm a lot, I'm a lot older than you. Um, so you've, you definitely nipped it in the bud sooner than I did. So congratulations on that. Okay. And yeah, I definitely regret not doing it sooner, but however, we could always look at it like everything worked out the way it was supposed to. And ironically, I didn't think I had a problem. I was already a life coach because everyone I compared myself to drank more than me. And <laughs> how convenient, how convenient. Yeah. yeah, in society, it's so acceptable. And um, I, I just really realized when I was studying, I was gonna add a niche, you know, I've got like all so many life coaching certifications at this point. And I was like, I'm gonna add on addiction recovery. And I was just was kind of, resonating with me a little too much. It was a little too familiar with me. Like I could relate to the addiction aspect of it. And that's honestly like learning about addiction recovery was when I realized, holy moly, I'm one of them. I'm, I'm an addict. Mm -hmm. And then also a food addict and, you know, sugar was like <laughs> almost as hard for me to quit as alcohol, honestly, like oh, that's, I don't doubt tough. It. that's a tough one. Cause yeah. And then it's funny because we crave what we eat. Like, so, so, and we crave like, and same, I think the same with the alcohol, you know, you crave mm -hmm. it more when, you know, so you, it just is a vicious cycle. So, totally. I mean, totally. it was with society being the way it is, it's really hard to see when you have a problem. It almost seems like the biggest scam in the world. Oh, I, I hundred percent agree. I, I find that the, the, the comment that I get more frequently than anything on on something that I post that could be deemed as controversial, an idea of an idea as, as controversial as being sober. <laughs> how dare you? <laughs> how how so dare contrary. I tell people that how <laughs> dare I tell people that what they ingest regularly is poisonous? Um, but it's ethanol, the, it's poison. Exactly. And the, and the comment I usually get back is, well, everything's, everything's fine in moderation. And it's like, well, you know, what, and then my answer, my, my answer first, or my question back every single time is what, how was moderation defined? Because your definition of moderation could be very different from mine and very different from the next guy and the next person over here. And so everyone has a different opinion of what moderation means. And so there's no standard and therefore Moderation to someone might mean having one beer once a month and moderation to someone else might be having four beers every single day. That's moderate to them, even though it's not moderate. So it's, it's really challenging to find a definition to what moderation is. And so the easiest way to kind of unlock your the superpower that sobriety really is, is just to abstain from it, to literally just not drink it. And it's easier said than done, obviously, because there are a lot of things that it's go everywhere. into that. It's, it's marketed towards us that if you don't drink, you're uncool or you're boring yeah. or, you know, you want to go on a date. Well, if you want to go on a date, you have to go out for drinks. Like you can't go out for coffee or you can't go for a workout or a hike or anything that doesn't revolve around drinking. Or if you're going to go for a hike, you may as well bring beers so that you can sit at the top of the mountain that you just spent six hours hiking up. Oh, to celebrate the view from the top, you should be drinking while you do it. Mm. And so it's, it's little things like that, that it's entangled it's, in it's, everything that we do. It's everywhere. And so it's so challenging to eliminate alcohol from our lives. And it's, you know, the tough part I find for a lot of clients that end up coming to me is they get to this place where they're like, I really want to, I'm ready and I'm willing to quit, but ready. And you have to be both ready to quit and willing to quit, but you also have to be ready and willing to grieve the fact you may never drink again. And most people are not ready to do that third part. Yeah. And that's the hardest part is, is coming to terms and coming to grips psychologically within yourself that I might've had my last drink ever. And, and maybe you didn't, and maybe you are able to, 
you know, do the work with me and, and get to a place where you change your relationship with alcohol there that, that you can go back to drinking and do it in a way that is like one beer here and there. Maybe that's the best case scenario for most people. I, I end up working with is they can change their relationship with alcohol. And I'm not saying it isn't possible because it 100% is possible. It's just, I think it's, it's rare. Yeah. I want to circle back to something that you said about how where it's kind of like we're considered not fun if we don't drink. And, and, and the reason I want to say it is because I, I acknowledge like for, for decades, I was one of those people who thought people who didn't drink were pretty lame and boring. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny now that I don't drink and I can look back and it's like, I was the boring one. I'm the one who had to drink poison in order to be fun. Like, mm -hmm. it's so interesting how we kid ourselves, you know, like there's a saying, the hardest thing for people to see is themselves. I definitely had a blind spot in that area. Anyone who didn't drink, I wouldn't have even considered dating somebody if they didn't drink. I would have thought that's a total lame weirdo. Like, why wouldn't they drink? It would have made me so uncomfortable. And what what's really at the base basis of that is our own insecurity, you know, of, <laughs> I don't want somebody to watch me drink when they're sober, they're going to remember everything. And, you know, and, and also you don't feel like they're going to be on the same wavelength because they're not. And, and anyone who's watching this is, might be a little bit sober curious. Um, if you're wondering, you know, we're not in any judgment at all. We've both been there. This is not a judgment place. This is just in case you've been thinking about it. Um, both of us, we, we help people, and you know early on in sobriety and it really takes a change of identity it takes it takes an energy shift is what happened with me because i had mm -hmm. quit unsuccessfully so many times and when i finally did quit for the last time i knew that 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 i knew i was done this this was an energetic shift I did not leave yeah. any window open. You know, this was a new, per I was no longer that person who's going to order red wine was my thing. I was not going to order red wine at lunch. <laughs> I would do it at lunch sometimes too, or dinner. I'm not going to have a Bloody Mary for breakfast because I'm hung over from the night before, you know, the hair of the dog. And um, I, I, neither one of us had a rock bottom. That's something interesting is, you know, our, our story, even though we're both so, our backgrounds are completely different. You're a younger guy. I'm an older female. Um, and we just had like no lifestyle things in common, but we still came to the same conclusion about like this biohacking on our lives. Kind of, you know what I mean? It's so interesting how we both kind of had a similar journey, even though we like <laughs> our lives were so different yet here we are feeling obligated to share this with other people because it, it transformed our lives completely. Like I would feel bad not telling people about, you know, trying to help people because of how totally. much it's improved my life. And I know you. Yeah. And, and that, yeah, I feel the exact same way. There's the, the, that is a, a point that I do want to make abundantly clear is I, this is a non judgment zone. The reason I developed my whole program and it's called the, the high performance mastery program, but another another name that i've called it is the roadmap out of hell i've i've been in the darkest depths of you know trauma and abuse and addiction mm -hmm. and i've seen some things and i've endured some things and it's safe to say that you know i and i tried to quit multiple times and it it wasn't until that final time when i just said yeah i said enough is enough and that that's it like i i made it like a declaration to myself internally and said, and I initially started as a hundred day sober challenge. It wasn't like I was at rock bottom. I was like, I'm just going to do a hundred days sober and, and see what happens. I'll reassess it after a hundred days and I'll go back to drinking. And I, and I did a hundred days. I got really close to that hundred day mark. And I thought, why well, don't I just go for six months? Like I'm already here. I've mm -hmm. already done almost four months. Like I may as right. well just go for six, you know, I'm already there. So I got to six months and I thought, well, I just did six months sober. I haven't had a sip of alcohol. Okay. Well, I should probably just try it for 12. Like, let's just go for a year and see what happens. So then I got to the year and I literally was planning on going out and having a drink. And I get to the 12 months and I've never had a sip since. Well, you feel and so it, good. Why ruin it? Like, it's that's, just, that's unbelievable. what it comes up to. And, and yeah. I had as, 
I commented on someone's post the other day and someone asked me back, why do you keep track of the number of days you've been sober? And the reason I keep track, and this is just something that I thought of in a moment is to gamify. I'm a, I'm a pretty competitive person, especially when it comes to myself. Uh, you know, I, I do ultra marathons, which is a significantly solo competition type sport. Like you're competing against yourself and how strong you are that day. Because I'm not competing to win the damn thing. I'm competing to finish the thing. And, and so like the side of the tracking, it comes back to like gamifying it, which for me, it, it just creates that daily commitment to competing against myself. That 1% better every single day is me choosing not to drink today so that that number grows by one yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. And so I can keep that streak alive. And there's, so that's one side of it. And then I just don't, I don't see myself as a, an addict. I don't call myself an alcoholic or an addict. I don't, I, I don't see myself either. as an, a non-drinker or I'm just like, I use the word, like, I'm just sober. I just like, I'm a non-drinker and alcohol has no real, you know, room in my we, we, life. We beat the addiction. And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying to anyone who AA, if AA is helping you, you should freaking keep going. But for really? me, AA was, had the opposite effect. Um, I think a lot of it's because I'm a law of attraction coach and I know about like how powerful words are and to stand up Mm. and every day or however often you go repeat, I am an alcoholic, you know, and also, like I said earlier, we need to create a new identity. We need to (laughs) shift our energy. That was keeping me in that same old energy that was keeping me. And I actually, that's why that's what my coaching is about is helping people raise their vibration and shift their energy to these addictions Mm -hmm. fall away. You know, like when you raise your energy, you're a new person, your, your vibrational set point is so high. And, you know, and that's kind of what, what you do too. You probably just use different terminology than, than I use, but we're doing the same thing is helping people feel so good that they don't want to go back to that old identity anymore. Pretty much. It's the same, same stuff. I, I believe in law of attraction, quantum physics, all of that stuff as well. Yeah, more, so physics, than say, what it is. more so than say organized religion and nothing, mm-hmm. nothing against organized religion. I've <laughs> Again, <been> non-judgment. <laughs> this is a non-judgment zone. I yes. have been baptized. I have been to church. I sometimes still go to church, but it, I, I myself do not see Jesus Christ as like my Lord and Savior type thing. I, I meditate and I think about the quantum and and law of attraction and the universe as a whole and God, God mm-hmm. energy, whatever that is, whatever terminology you want to use. So, but I, I also found that AA has a certain it carries a certain frequency and a certain energy and. Just for me, that's how I perceive it. And it's no judgment. If, if it's working, go. Continue to go. I think it is a fantastic resource and it is a fantastic tool to help a lot of people. Yeah. I, I do whatever myself, works. Do whatever works for, for I you. I myself don't love the words alcoholic and I don't love the word relapse. Why put a label use, on things? I don't, yeah. I use non-drinker or no room in my life for alcohol. That's kind of how I word it. Yeah. Cause there's just no room in my life for alcohol. And instead of calling something a relapse, I don't use that word with clients. I use data point because it, that's ex- essentially what it is. It's, it's a data point into how you were feeling in that moment that you chose to go back to the substance so that when you are faced with a similar experience and a similar feeling, you're, you can say, you know what? I've been here before and mm-hmm. this is what I chose to do last time. So I'm going to choose to do something else this time. It's a data point. That's all it is. And if you take away the negativity of relapse and put in the word data point, then you're like, it's just a point on a graph. That's all it is. I like that because you're taking that energetic spark out, that negative energetic spark out of, because words are so powerful, you guys. Like we got to be careful, especially when you say I am, 
fill in the mm-hmm. blank, anything that you fill in the blank after you say, I am, be careful what you say, because you're literally in creation mode when you say, I am. And I mean, back to that reminds me of your organized religion. I'm also not an organized religion person. And I would like to insert that neither was Jesus. I do believe in Jesus, but Jesus was trying to tell us that we all have this connection. Jesus was teaching meditation, all the things you mentioned, Jesus was trying to show us like um, about all of this stuff. And, and even though it wasn't called law of attraction, he certainly was showing us about things like that and healing ourselves. And he said, totally. and I say this in almost every podcast because it comes up, but he in the Bible, it says that he said, everything that I do, you can do too. He, he didn't, he wasn't into going to the temples. He was trying to show you nature, go out in nature. God is everywhere. Like, and that's when I feel closest to totally god or source energy or whatever is being out in nature and and um quieting our minds doing breath work which is something that you're really into as well and something that you teach your clients is breath work that is that is kind of the main the main tool i use to access identity shifts physiological shifts and any pretty much any of the human performance work i do i i find the easiest tool to access is breathwork and using and i now in the world of breathwork breathwork right now is super trendy it's it's like where yoga was 30 years ago (laughs) and you know there's this style and that style and and everyone says that this style is better than that style and that style is better than this one and and that's the thing in the breathwork space just like you know hot yoga and yin yoga and sun salutations all that stuff i don't know yoga i'm just kind of talking out of my butt but that uh that's kind of the scope of breath work right now but i i like to think of the breath work that i practice is performance based so it's mm. human performance breathing training so using proper breathing mechanics to either simulate a stress adaptation or simulate a sympathetic nervous system state response in the body you can do so laying down on a couch where you're going to be safe where you're going to be able to work within your like how far you want to push yourself is how far you're going to you're going to go into that breath work experience even if i'm guiding you you're Mm -hmm. only going to go as far as you want to go and that's what i do with all my clients that that's kind of the system, but so you can simulate a sympathetic response, which would be a fight, flight, freeze. So you can, you can simulate what that is going to do and create the stress adaptation on the body in a laying down setting where nothing bad is going to happen to you. And you can see what changes occur within the body and you can create an opportunity for the body to learn how to build some resilience whether it's physical, mental, or emotional resilience in that moment that you can then use and transfer those skills into a real world s- scenario situation type thing. Or alternatively, you can use the other. So parasympathetic would be the down-regulated, calm, relaxed state. Mm-hmm. And you can simulate that same response to be able to use that when a situation comes up. Say you're having a, an argument with a spouse, you can while you're in that argument, if you've practiced the breath work and had that, those skills, you can say to yourself, quietly in your mind, take a breath in the nose, slow exhale out through the nose while still in an argument. And you'll probably respond in a more loving approach. And like you can tap to... back into that energy because you've already been in that energy. Is that what totally. you're saying? And that's, that's the work that I do a lot with clients is to simulate those stress situations but also those downregulated non-stress situations yeah i'm i've got a breath work um just a guided one that i send to my clients usually they're on the first session um if they're open to it not everybody is a lot of people still think that's weird you know when um or even just regular meditation is weird so this breath work meditation yeah. though it never fails. Like everybody cries because it's releasing trapped energy. You guys, like you want to get that stuff out and everyone thinks they don't have it. We all like, I cry, you know, I, I do this. And, and then it's like, I, I won't do it every day or anything, but like once a month or something. And there's always stuff to be released. Like we want to keep oh, that yeah. energy moving, keep it moving. Um, when we have this 
suppressed emotions and suppressed, you know, things that we haven't dealt with in general, even though we're pushing it down, it's still on our body and it does affect us physically. Would you agree? Oh, big time, big time. I did, I had a breath work session last week and holotropic breath work session and I cried and there was all kinds of tears and emotions that came up through the, throughout the whole process, but it was also fantastic. So I, yeah, I mean, I, it's a really, I, I feel like the, if you're going to do anything and I also posted about it today, but it's, if you're going to get, if you're going to work with a coach, if anyone's going to work with a coach, work with a coach who is it, who's actually achieved the end result that you're looking to get. So if you're wanting to run a marathon, hire a coach that's actually run a marathon right. that knows what it is. Not just, not just from book learning, you guys, book learning <laughs> or, you know, find someone that walks and they're the done walk, that, not just talks the talk. Mm -hmm. And that, that is so important. I find because, you know, when it comes to working with, uh, with clients and, and some of the people I work with, and especially with the sobriety element into the human performance, my level of human performance has only been achieved because of all the work I've been able to do on myself. And I do it every single day. And it's that constant walk in the walk type mentality, yes. as opposed to just talking about what it is that I do. And so I, I try to, I feel like that's the biggest thing that we can all be, especially in 2024 is this, as our collective world shifts is stepping into being more and more authentic and less yeah. about talking about what you do and more about just showing what you do and people, yeah. your people will show up. And, 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 and that's why I had to, to quit too. Once I learned I had the addiction, once I, once I made that connection and was like, Oh my gosh, you know, um, probably a lot of people thought I had a problem. I was abusing alcohol. It was just that I didn't see it. Right. Mm. You know, I know my mom was always on my case <laughs> and, um, Mine too. but I just thought she was like, whatever, she's just a mom, whatever. Of course she mm -hmm. thinks that just, you know, she's controlling or whatever we tell people they're you're just trying to control me. And, you know, they had a point. Um, but you know, as soon as, what was I, I forgot what I was going to say about that, the addiction, but yeah, as soon as I knew that's what it was, integrity, I had mm. to change. I had, I can't be a coach at this point and be talking out of both sides of my mouth. Like before I, I was, I was coaching other things, not, a, not really, um, addiction. Um, but as soon as I added that on and realized and, and made that connection with myself, I could no longer Plus I learned so much about alcohol. How do I enjoy it? How do I enjoy it now? Knowing what I know, I can't even like, you know, so and it's, you guys, it, it makes, it dumbs down your brain. Sorry if you don't know it yet. This is still not judgment. I, I think about like, let's say I'm out with friends and they're drinking and I'm not, I, it, I'm not judging them. I'm thinking about, oh my gosh, I used to do, whether they're repeating their words, slurring their words, you know, telling the same joke over and over. I'm not judging them. I'm just going, like a little bit horrified about myself going, I was exactly, exactly like that. In fact, I was even more annoying, you know, as, as much as I talk, do you think that drinking alcohol shut me up? Hell no. It put no, I had no filter, you know, That's and uninhibited yeah. version of me is, you know, kind of wild. So um, <laughs> I'm just saying that you, I, yeah, it's just a very interesting thing. And we called this episode, break out of the matrix um, for, for several reasons. One of them was the alcohol thing because society is so fixated and obsessed, obsessed, obsessed with alcohol. So obsessed that you're like, I, you guys, like until you're out of it, you don't know that you're literally in autopilot sleep mode. And, um, that's my opinion now, because now that I'm on the other side of it, I would have never been able to see that before. Probably sober. only our sober, sober, curious people who are already questioning them, their habits. They're the only ones who could even hear us right now. Everyone else has probably shut us down. They're not even watching anymore. <laughs> and they, they might not be. And there's, there's, you know, an element to that. I, I feel like a large part of the whole waking up to the collective energy, whatever you want to talk about, uh, however you want to talk about it being uh you know what the wef and what the who and those 
jackasses in Davos are talking about that type of mentality. All the things that they're talking about are, and they talk about, you know, and this is probably a great segment into something that I know you want to talk to. Yeah. It's coming next. Is, is, is kind of carnivore. Yeah. Is, is how they want us to stop eating red meat. They want us to stop eating all of these things that they want us to stop doing all the things that allow us to live our optimal human performance. And they want us to be sick. They want us to be dependent on them to listen to what they have to say, to, to eat, like to stay home, to not want to work, to not want to build a business, to not want to go to the gym. They want you to stay mm-hmm. home and play video games. They want you to have that work for home lifestyle. They want you to numb out and drink alcohol and do drugs and smoke your vape. And, and don't pay attention to what we're doing in the other, background. Don't pay attention to all stuff. this. Yeah. They, they, they're doing all this stuff in the background. And as long as we're numb and, and not paying attention to it, you know, we're not, we're going to be easy to control. Right. Um, exactly. So, so let's, let's take a step back to, to this carnivore conversation. So, so, so first of all, I want to do a big, huge disclaimer for anybody watching Shay and I are not doctors and we don't claim to be, but we do both share a very similar story. Another thing that we couldn't believe when we were first chatting about this podcast episode um, months ago, maybe, I don't remember what it was, but um, when we were first talking about it, um, we both were uh, used to suffer with autoimmune and um, for for three years, I was going to doctors and, and traditional stuff, trying to figure it out. No one could figure stuff out. Um, channeled to me by two different psychics was, and it, it's the craziest thing, you know, because I ate mostly vegetables, 80% vegetables. My diet was impeccable by anyone's standards. 80% vegetables, organic, clean. Um, and then when I did add protein, it would be organic chicken, wild caught salmon. I was a very clean eater in shape. You know, um, I'd already quit drinking. So like I lost the extra weight um, from that. That was tw- like 20 pounds that I lost that from drinking, by the way. And I know you lost mm-hmm. a significant amount after you quit drinking alcohol as well. Mm-hmm. Didn't you? I, I, or you I, probably gained muscle though. I, I gained gained weight. Actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when I, right, when right. I, when I drank, I didn't, you didn't work when out. I was a drinker. I, I didn't work out. I didn't really eat and I would just drink my calories. I was oh, actually shit. super That's skinny. Not... So I was kind of the opposite Okay. of most, okay. most people that drink, eat a really crappy diet and not to mention alcohol also creates this like puffiness and inflammation all throughout the, the body. Toxin, so most people end up getting super look. Most people get most like puffy and stuff. I actually was like super sunken in cheekbones. Mm. I I literally look sick and and like sick. Do you think that's because Skinny. like malnutrition? Like you weren't because it alcohol depletes us of vitamins and minerals, and maybe it was I, like that look. You know, like there was I'm definitely starving that I, to I, death. I <laughs> and I didn't eat. I didn't eat nearly that much. I mean, I I ate carbs and I ate vegetables and I ate meat. Mm-hmm. I've kind of always okay. eaten. A very similar diet. I have a bunch of allergies, so that kind of food allergies limits food allergies. So it kind of limits me in what I can eat to begin with. But when I was drinking, I would just like if I had a night of drinking, I just wouldn't eat when I got home. Like I would just fill up on alcohol and calories from alcohol, empty calories, and then it and then it would be an empty stomach, and I'd just wake up hungover and feel so crappy that the best way to get over the hangover was to drink more alcohol, which I'm still not putting food back in. So it was, I just didn't eat very much. So when I got, when I finally got sober, I started gaining weight because I was gaining muscle mass. So I was eating. Right. Okay. I knew you were out of shape before. That's all I knew you were, but now you're in shape. We we've got your picture of you on the thumbnail here. Everyone's going to see that. (laughs) I saw that. You're doing okay. So, um, but so with mine in the the two psychics who told me I have to get rid of vegetables because of they're toxic for me. I was in disbelief. I didn't. I was fighting it, you know. And and around the same time, this video pops up about carnivore diet. And one of the psychics said that video keeps popping up. And I, I kept because I was like gross. Like that's how I thought because I was I wasn't a veg- vegetarian, but I was eighty percent vegetables was my main sustenance. 
And they were like, plants are medicine. They're not meant to be sustenance. But so my belief, my personal belief system, that wasn't a good match for. So I wanted to fight these people. I was like, that can't be true. That can't be true. But within a week after letting vegetables go, the only change that I made, because I was then I was eating the meat and no vegetables, because I already wasn't eating carbs. I wasn't eating processed foods. I wasn't one of those people. I was already very healthy. I already mentioned all of my problems went away. Like all of these things, like even like my jaw, my jaw clenching. I had this like TMJ situation going on, muscle aches and pains. Um, I want to say, oh, my hormones have rebalanced. I put a list here so I didn't forget. Headaches gone. I was getting migraines all the time, gone. Better sleep, lost weight, lost more weight. I have more energy. And I'm like, I thought we needed carbs to have energy. And I was getting a lot of recurrent infections because it turned out like the vegetables were toxic for me and tearing up my gut. So this is the disclaimer, guys. Everybody's gut's different. You have a different microbiome than I have. So this is just, we're telling this to you guys. And he's going to tell his story because a lot of vegans and vegetarians, I've already gotten a lot of hate from just comments I've made about being healed this way. Um, they don't want to hear it, no. but there's some people who might have autoimmune. And I can tell you that I know so many people now, cause I'm in these carnivore groups who have completely healed stuff. Like, well, rheumatoid arthritis is a big one that goes away. IBS is gone. SIBO goes away. SIBO is small intestine bacterial overgrowth, like leaky gut situations go away. Hashimoto's, eczema, rosacea gone, acne gone. You had that issue. I know we, we both talked about that. Um, inflammation is the underlying thing, you guys. If you're ingesting toxins, your body's inflamed. Uh, lupus, Lyme disease. People have gotten rid of Lyme disease. Uh, it's just, it's, and these are all things people that I've, that I've met and talked to since, since I went carnivore and I'm only five months in, I'm only five months in and feel a million times better. I feel like I'm 25 years old. I'm 49. And like, I didn't feel this good at 25. So it's like, I literally had to hear it from spirit. It was channeled to me and because I could have never switched my belief system into this because I was like vegetables, good beef, bad you know and how could you kill a i was I, so any vegetarian is like blah, 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 blah. i've already been there i've already used to think that way for decades so yeah. you can say anything you want in the comments below but you're not going to convince people who have become healthy from being really unhealthy with autoimmune disorders you're not going to convince us to go back also that's not very nice of you because um <laughs> you want to minimize suffering but it's okay to have human suffering you guys go back to eating stuff that made you really sick like i don't get that mentality why do you want me to go back to eating a way that was making me very sick you know yeah, like yeah. you don't care about humans only cows okay i don't think they care about humans <laughs> i don't think they care about cows either but I, I do know about being if right. we're talking about, <laughs> I, I know if we're talking about the global elites, they are definitely, they will still be eating red meat because yeah. they know that it is healthy and they don't want to uh, be sick themselves. Um, but to like, to touch on the, on the carnivore stuff and kind of how I made that switch. Now it's been, yeah. it's been just over three months for me uh, as, as full blown carnivore. Before that, I was kind of doing that more like Paul Saladino's animal based. So, I mean, I don't eat. You know, yeah, I've only been strict for three meat, months, but I two I, months of it, I was still being for, bad and eating some dairy and things. And so, so I think I'm actually three months strict, if you want to put it that way, in five months trying. Yeah. Sorry that's, to interrupt you. That, yeah, no, no, that's fine. It's that's probably how I would word my, myself It's it's three months strict before that I kind of did one and a half years of an animal based, no mm -hmm. vegetables, but red meat, primarily, uh, a little bit of other meat sources here and there chicken. I don't particularly enjoy. It doesn't really make me feel very good. Same. Pork, pork. I don't eat pork at all. Same. It really upsets my stomach. So I literally, and, and I'm not a big fan of fish or the flavor of fish. And so Dang. I eat, <laughs> so I eat red meat and Me too. particularly ruminant meat. So, uh, beef, bison, deer, and elk, uh, for the most part, I 
am a hunter. I have friends that hunt as well. And so I have a whole bunch of elk meat in my currently like ethically hunted yeah. sourced uh, elk meat in my Not freezer. For fun. For, mainly, you actually mainly, eat it. It's actually mainly elk in here. So that that's like a really, a, a really big pro for me is having that and also access because of my friends to fantastic grass fed natural meat. So yeah. that's a big thing, but I, so I, I kind of made the shift from the animal based, which I was still eating fruit and stuff, uh, fruit, honey, maple syrup, salt, uh, red meat and primarily red meat. Mm-hmm. And that was most of my diet. There was no processed foods in that, but I ate that way thinking that I needed to have the fruit and stuff. And it wasn't until I started following guys like Dr. Anthony Chafee mm. uh, and Dr. Sean O'Mara and Sean, and, Baker. Some, and, and Sean Baker and and all these other doctors that are carnivore that are, you know, Ken Berry, he's a good one. Ken Berry as well. Yes. Yeah. So those are kind of the main four that I was following and they're all different ages, but kind of all between 70 and, and 40 mm-hmm. and living in terms of optimal human performance. Yes. And, and that's where I was like, and okay, they weren't maybe, before. maybe this is something. Mm-hmm. And that was a big thing is maybe, you know, and they weren't, they weren't prior. Um, even, even someone like Dave Asprey, I'm not the biggest Dave Asprey fan. However, I know he was vegan, but he's switched into a, a way more animal based diet. And yeah, he has talked about it openly about. Oh, I how, heard him shooting down vegans the other day, and he's a, his, he's a uh, past a former vegan. Yeah, so a former vegan now, fully kind of more on the animal based, is showing the results of mm-hmm. what it does to his health, and that's yeah. a, that's a big one. I've I found for myself, autoimmune wise, uh, I kind of the main issues I always had with carbohydrates, vegetables all that stuff is that caused inflammation, mainly in my joints. Uh, I found it really hard to recover after a workout. That was a big one for myself. My energy levels in the afternoon would always dip every single time I would get to around now, which is kind of that two o'clock mountain time. Mm -hmm. And, and I would want to have a nap and Mm -hmm. I, I am actually so full of energy that it's like, I'm like, no, I'm good now. But you know, that was a bit of a change that I need to have. I, I am celiac. So there are certain things that a lot of cross-contamination stuff would end up getting into my diet and just cause mm. that leaky gut celiac stuff, which from the inflammation would then cause acne and eczema and, and all kinds of things that really. For people well, who don't know, is that like the gluten sensitivity? You, Celiac is that gluten sensitivity yep. for people who don't know. Yep. So gluten, it's a gluten allergy. Gluten uh, allergy. So more so than a sensitivity, I if I have gluten now, it really messes me up. I end up spending a few days in bed in the bathroom, and and so it's just not like I mean, what's like why why would I risk that, or why would I risk having to deal with that because three days of feeling crappy is going to end up leading to um, two or three weeks of bad acne and bad Mm -hmm. skin and then inflammation, my joints and feelings, this like brain fog and and feeling like you're 80 low energy and and feeling old, like feeling really old. I'm 34. And I, I, I literally feel, as you said, better than I did at 25. When I was 25, I was drinking a lot and using all kinds of, you know, eating Mm -hmm. shitty diet and, and having a a really awful day-to-day life. And now at 34, I've, my body, like I train CrossFit Mm -hmm. or functional fitness, but five, six, seven days a week and have no issues waking up and going again the next day. My recovery is the yeah. best it's ever been. Yeah. I'm gaining I'm gaining more weight being carnivore than I was. And and to start, so when I first did the carnivore, I, I kind of lost a little bit. And then as I got more comfortable with carnivore, my weight started going up and my muscle mass started 
going up as well. And so I started feeling really, really good. And so it was that I just got a bunch of blood work done. And just recently, just recently, because that's one of the most important things with switching to a meat based diet. Yeah. And, and a strict sure. carnivore, I really wanted to double check on see what's going on internally. As my yeah. father passed away of a heart attack at 35, what? I was like, let's be like proactive about this because all of the data, the, the data, I say it in air quotes, is funded by companies that are invested like in they plant have based? something to in there, they have something to gain from big pharma like statins mm. and stuff like this if they pro promote a a cholesterol is bad point of view mm -hmm. type mm -hmm. thing so that's oh, kind of what yep. the data has been said to to show so i ended up getting some blood work and my cholesterol or my ldl went up a little bit it's still in the healthy range but it went up my hdl went down and my doc said that because the cholesterol will go up my immune system is actually more robust and stronger so i'm less likely to get sick or have anything else negative occur also the other kind of main stuff so uh liver enzymes all that stuff no fiber in my diet and people are saying fiber is essential. Your, your liver can't, your liver and your kidneys can't survive on a straight carnivore diet. Yeah. Well, my blood work says that my liver and kidneys are performing better on a carnivore diet. Now I am also, I, I do drink a lot of electrolytes. That is, I'd say one of the big keys when it comes to keeping your energy levels up mm -hmm. and really fleshing out a lot of the, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call them toxins, but flushing out and helping the liver and kidneys process red meat yeah. and do so in a, in a really functional way is to get a high amount of high sodium and really high quality electrolytes. Oh yeah. I day. use a lot of salt. I use the, the, is it real Redmond's Redmond's real salt or something. Yep. And then I also use, um, the Celtic mm -hmm. or is it called Celtic? Self, it's C I, I don't know, but oh, it's yeah. got all the, it's got all of the, the minerals that you need. And so you use a lot of that to keep your electrolytes balanced because that is something that get easily thrown off. And then the other thing you got to do is increase your good fat. Like I, so I basically, since I'm still in the gut healing process, I'm, I'm the, what they say to really do is I'm doing only beef, well, beef and eggs, beef and eggs, yep. and then the salt and beef tallow a lot of beef tallow like i'm eating so much mm. fat you guys and it you I, it's everything opposite of what we were trained like what like what right. i was trained like as far as sports nutrition i have a certification in that like all, like everything that i was told in the food pyramid and and then the cholesterol thing you were talking about when you really find out that the sugar companies paid off these harvard professors and this is anyone can google this it's real um to say that fat was the thing that was causing high cholesterol. And now we know it's actually sugar. And um, something really bad to do is combine fat and sugar, though. That's like the death thing. Like if you're gonna if you're gonna have sugar, you don't want to have a lot of fat, you know, so that's a bad combination. But it's not it's the sugar causing the problem, not the fat. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. But so yeah, so I'm doing those things is is and also how you get the meat sourced is so important. I am not a proponent of the big food industry in any way, shape or form. I only buy from responsible ranchers who care for their animals. It's, 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 I mean, as cruelty free as it can possibly be and grass fed, like you said. Yeah. So um, it's, it's just, it's just really, it does matter how you get your food. Um, and something interesting that people ask me, do you feel, don't you feel so restricted? Cause I'm not eating a variety. And I mm. actually can tell you this, if you're a food addict, like I am or was, um, we're not gonna use that label. This is just so I can tell the story. Yeah. What happens is when, you know, like I said earlier, you kind of crave what you eat. Since I cut out all of the stuff, any type of sugar or carbohydrates, I quit craving it. So I actually feel less restricted because I don't have cravings all day like I used to. I'm actually feel less restricted than ever. 
<laughs> so it's just so weird. So like, it's, just, it's like a food addict's dream, you know, really, because you just, when you don't have the cravings, you, you don't even think about it. And before I was constantly like stopping myself. I really want this, but I can't have it. Mm -hmm. You know, that situation, I wasn't, I wasn't indulging. I just always wanted it. And now those feelings aren't there in my brain, in my body. It's just, they, they don't exist anymore because I don't, the, the cravings are simply gone. And then the last thing I wanted to say, so I don't forget, is that the spirit to this, I know a lot of spiritual people watch this show because it's called Spiritual Transformation Podcast with Mary Beth. And mm -hmm. um, I want you guys to know there, you, there's, a, there's a, a lot of people in the spiritual community would deem eating meat bad and less than spiritual. Mm -hmm. um, I have met so many people now in the spiritual community who are hiding this like they're so they they don't want people to know like they're psychics their channels but it's also cured them and they're afraid to say it because they know the judgment that comes with it and all they're doing is trying to be healthy because they were so sick before you know uh one of my good friends had also ulcer ulcerative colitis she was dying her her body was eating itself quite literally she was on death's door and when she she was a vegan and when she they brought her um chicken stock in the hospital and she said her soul just came back like it, like she's like oh my gosh i had her quote here she said i thought my soul has returned to my body and i never looked back just from that and she she says we're animals we need our protein and it took her almost dying to get there and i think sometimes mm -hmm. vegans can be so militant and they're thinking, you know, that it's cruel. Actually, it's cruel. Like you're, you, you, you want to represent minimizing suffering, but actually, I mean, to be honest with you, there's a lot of suffering that goes on in plant when you're making plant-based products. You know, a lot of <laughs> suffering. So it's a, ignorance is bliss. I know I won't go there. I'll let you go there if you want to. But anyway, what are your thoughts on that in the spiritual community or whatever you want to comment on, really? Yeah, I, uh, I, I do find. And this, this, I put it in a, a larger part of like the spiritual community, but also the spiritual or the awake crowd, whatever terminology you want to use. But the people that chose not to take an experimental injection, there okay. are a lot of those people that believe that if we are going to be living our most high frequency, we would be eating plants and mm -hmm. not eating meat. And I think that is total BS because when I eat plants, I feel so low and so mm -hmm. depressed and I have so much inflammation and my energy is low. I'm depressed. And there's actually a study. It came out recently. I think it was on, I, I need to find it. There was a headline on the New York times. And then they quoted the article in the, in the story of vegans are more vegans and vegetarians are like, I think it's 80% more likely to be depressed than meat eaters. Like just throwing that out oh, there. Yeah, all my brain be, fog went away. High vibe, yeah, yeah. If we want to be high vibe. We should be eating a more ancestral carnivore, carnivorous diet like we did millions of years ago when we were primarily carnivore based people. And you look at the most, you look at most Native American tribes around the globe majority of them have that are still quite traditional have a primarily meat-based diet because it helps them live their best life and that's how they've been able to live their best best lives into 2023 2024 while staying kind of remote and within their tribe yeah and so that's and you can go back into native american history in north america and all of them were a primarily meat ba meat based diet just it is what it is it's just, it's not and the vegan diet is is a new bad diet that is new within the last 50 60 years it's not like it's been around for millions and millions of years it hasn't it's been around for since like the sixties with hippies. And if so somebody's thriving on it, stay on it. Keep, keep doing what makes you feel good. But eventually if like, you're like, it took decades for vegetables to affect me. It was they, what the, the, they called it a, a toxic buildup. And what mm -hmm. we're talking about you guys is um, 
lectins and oxalates. You guys can look it up. I'm going to put some videos. I think like I'll put links to Dr. Chafee and a few other, I'll put some videos under, under, in, in the description box for you guys to check out if you're interested in looking into it more. But yeah, everybody should continue to do whatever, what if whatever's making you thrive. But yeah. like the people that Absolutely. I know who are uh, vegetarian and um, vegan, mostly vegan, they get so weak, you know, they, 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 they become so weak. Mm. And I think they just think this is how you feel. And it's kind of like when we quit drinking, we didn't know how good we could feel. It's kind yeah. of a similar thing. Like all my brain fog went away um, when I quit vegetables days after I didn't have vegetables. Like I did go through a detoxing. I did. Mm -hmm. um, I got um, like eczema, all this deep, like it was crazy. The ox, I think that's the oxalate. Yeah. Build yeah. Up. And it's, I'm, I'm not here to state that there's a, ju a judgment if someone is vegan. I, I think obviously our, our diet and our nutrition is so unique to every individual on planet right. Earth. Everybody's different. And totally do what is best for yourself to thrive. I will say that the one thing I will say on 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 that, so that's you know a non-judgment zone. However, and still no judgment, it is very challenging to make sh to to ingest enough protein when you're on a wow. vegan diet. It's just really challenging to find high quality protein sources that are complete proteins and not processed and not processed and not full of harmful crap. Like, like tofu is, is made from soy and soy is one of the most sprayed plants yes. in the world. Like if, if we're talking about glyphosate and eliminating mm. stuff, that's terrible for your for your gut microbiome and creates massive inflammation in your body. Glyphosate is probably the number one thing that does that. And the most widely sprayed plants on earth are soybeans, corn, and other beans or legumes, which are like the three main protein sources for vegans. So it's like, well, you're, so you can do that. And it's like, well, I'm getting this organic soybeans, but it's like, well, how organic are, are they? Because yeah. there is organic and then there's organic that's still been sprayed. So yeah. it's really hard to know what's what. Whereas when it comes to grass-fed, grass-finished beef, especially ruminant animal, if you're a hunter, you're getting your animals deep into the wilderness. It is 100%. They're eating grass. They're eating yeah. like native grasses on the side of a mountain. If it's deer and elk or moose. If it's bison or beef and it's grass fed and grass finished, then you know that the land has not been sprayed. It's just literally natural, natural grass. And that's all they eat their entire lifetime. They, from, from being raised to, to when they are slaughtered and turned into beautiful cuts of meat, right. that's kind of that evolution of it. So I just, you know, that's the one thing that, and I have some friends who are vegan and, and no judgment. Yeah, to me too. Me if too. It's, if it's working for them, great. I do often challenge them to say, you know, to get, to build the body you want or to live that optimal human performance that you're looking to build, because I know they are, it's really challenging to find protein sources that their bodies can handle and tolerate while, while eating the amount they need to eat while also eliminating a lot of the crap that goes into them yeah what about carbs like you know didn't it blow your mind this blew my mind more than eight. there's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate what i was trained to think that's how we get our energy mm -hmm. but guess who's had zero carbs in months zero and i have more energy than ever so you know yeah. it, it, you know i wanted to bring up this twin study have you seen the twin study yet they're trying to um they had a, like a twin mm. one of them goes carnivore one of them that goes that new netflix documentary but it's I, an eight I, week I, thing it's eight weeks and, and, and by the way it takes six months to fully adjust a carnivore according to my sources yeah. my psychic sources it takes six full months to, before your body's really adjusted um eight weeks and then like well, oh well the the twin who was a vegan lost weight well no shit, sherlock of course they're gonna lose weight on a vegan diet 
Um, I go have ahead. A, I, I watched and muscle. Paul, Paul, Paul Saladino talk about this and he posted about it the other day because someone obviously sent it to him. And I, and just, just to throw this out there, I'm not advocating on that. I'm a massive Saladino fan by any means. I do think he has some, some fantastic. I don't know knowledge. much about him. People, a lot of people love him. A lot of people hate him. He's very polarizing in that space, but, and I'm not here to say one way or the other, go and do your own research. But if you look at the studies from that movie and from that documentary of the two twins, uh, the one that was on the vegan diet was was fed less calories. So oh, number yeah. one, they're going to lose weight. They're in a caloric deficit. So it's literally, it's it's mathematically impossible for the, the vegan diet twin to gain more muscle or to gain more weight than the other one. It's yeah. just, it's not possible because you're in a caloric deficit while still maintaining a normal a normal lifestyle. So you're moving your body and all that stuff. So you're, and you're not putting enough calories in that you're burning. So you're burning more and you're than you're muscle. eating. So mm -hmm. you're going to lose that muscle. Your body's going to be naturally in a, in autophagy. You're going, it's going to be eating itself for sustenance. That's what happens when we are in a fast mm -hmm. and a fast longer than there is enough, enough nutrients being put back in that can be used as building blocks to create fuel for the body if there is no fuel left in the body like an amino acid it's going to go to your muscle fiber and eat itself because it needs that fuel yeah and so you know i i, I eat I more watched, calories I than ever watch that thing oh i haven't, I haven't either i just i just i just heard about it and i was like i'm not gonna watch it because it'll just piss me off because just <laughs> actually you get to the where they just say eight week study i'm already out i'm already like well that's stupid that means meaningless and yeah whatever eight week study there's a couple of things like in brackets of how the vegan person had a certain diet that was different from what the omnivorous uh, twin had. And so the one main thing was caloric deficit. And I saw that and I was like, well, I'm not going to read, I'm not going to watch this. Right. Call and, me when it's eight years, then I'll watch yeah, that. One. Yeah, I'll watch it. Also, they need to be having the same amount of calories. Each. Correct. Uh, yeah. And, and you can't, and when you look at who deficit. made it, who who was like like when you look behind the people who were behind the scenes, oh, they were all benefited. They were all vegans and 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 plant based it's push, companies. Pushing a narrative, it's it's same yeah. thing that happens with um, the old the old uh, experimental jab jab in the yarn. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people that are that are interested in 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 lining their pocketbooks, and the great, greatest way to Profit over to people. See anything. You just follow the money and and who who is that who is that study, you know, funded by? And and same right. thing in the alcohol industry. All the all the alcohol companies funded all these studies that say that moderate drinking is good. Why? Because it benefits them. It doesn't benefit the consumer. It benefits the company making money. The mm -hmm. only way to sell your product if it is actually poison, which it is would be to it's labeled as do, a carcinogen it's labeled to cause cancer um it is. and well i don't know if they actually have the label on the i think they had they took they removed it but but if you google it it's you can see that it's it's a definitely Another causes carcinogen. cancer it, it causes all kinds of cancer and a lot yeah. of other things too and 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 so the like and the way those studies work, and I can kind of touch on it because I've read a lot of those studies as yeah. just, and, you know, to put it out there, I'm not a doctor. Again, I will very blatantly state, once again, neither of us are doctors. I am not a doctor. I, I read these studies because I want to educate myself and how uh, someone's point of view might be different than my own. Mm -hmm. It's the best way to, to formulate an educated belief upon yeah whatever my beliefs are, but in, in order to be educated on them, I find it is way more beneficial to read both sides of the argument and see both sides, both sides is opinion. And so I read a lot of these studies, but what they do is say, say it's a nutritional supplement company or a, uh, a vaccine or a medication or alcohol, whatever it is, the person that's funding it, say it's, this vodka drink, they will 
pay the scientists and say, find me everything you can about how this benefits mm -hmm. someone. They don't say, find me everything that's wrong about this. They say, find me everything you can about how this will benefit someone's life. And then they write the study about how it will benefit them, even though, even though it might do, you know, there might not be any benefits. They'll they figure will create, out a way. Yeah. They will create benefits to help publish this study because they're getting paid millions of dollars to publish a study that has nothing to do with helping people. And right. so there is a lot of that that goes on. And it's just, that's, you know, what's created this whole science and the whole movement of trust the science, trust the science. Well, the science is often science paid is off by, yeah. by people that gain to profit off of and the truth, the truth gets pushing. censored. And that's, yeah, that's a good, like, break out of the matrix conversation there. And Dr. Ken Berry talks about that a lot because he is a doctor. And yeah. he admits that doctors, uh, traditionally, they just, um, they don't read the study. They just read the conclusions. And they don't really, he says, but when he really started going in and reading the actual study, the conclusion didn't match the study the majority of the time. So that's really messed up. And he also admits, and I think everybody kind of, not everybody, but a lot of people know this, that doctors were not trained in nutrition. So for us to say we're not a doctor, I guarantee, I guarantee this because I, I, because I've experienced it, that I know more about nutrition than most doctors do because I, that's been like my life. I know you do. And like when my mom was dying of cancer, I mean, Shay, that's when I, I mean, I have PTSD from that shit because they were giving her all the sugar and, and the way they feed a cancer patient. I'm like, sugar feeds cancer, you know, and, and I'm sitting there teaching the nurses and talking to the doctors, you know, and my brother and I were bringing in food for her because the way they are, it's, 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 it's criminal. It is criminal. Mm -hmm. And then they, it's not like they're being evil. They literally didn't know. Oh, well, ensure that's good for her. Ensure drink, you know, um, it's yeah. like a, it's I'm like, full Oh, of, full sugar, of and sugar and seed oils. Yes. And it was just scary how little they knew. And I mean, I was kind of traumatized by that whole experience. Um, cause I'm like literally scared of hospitals at this point now after seeing what my, my mom went through and so many levels outside of that. Also with, I know you're in mm -hmm. Canada. I don't know if it's any better there though, but just dealing with, um, the insurance companies and how much, how much it is per night for them to take shitty care of the, I mean, I didn't see my mom getting good care at all. It was just the, the healthcare system, big pharma, the, the, everything that we dealt with around my mom's cancer. And, you know, when she ultimately died, uh, two years ago on Christmas day, um, it, it was just, I mean, just a nightmare. It's just, it's like, and this is, what are we paying for? And then they're the experts. It's scary. It's just, it just scared the crap out of me. Like I'm, yeah. I'm dying at home. I'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and there's, there's that, so that's another side. There's this, there's this scientist and he's a PhD scientist and he's great. And he's very factually, factually correct and, and reads and cites studies all the time. But his main thing is he goes against people like Saladino and Asprey and all these other people because they, they're not using in his mind, peer reviewed studies and peer reviewed based on what he wants to see essentially. And I, and I think, oh. and I, I don't want to name him. Um, you know, people know who he is. <laughs> I, I don't I don't love the guy I don't hate the guy I'm neutral I have no it doesn't do anything for me one side or the other I do I, what I would say is that when it comes to um kind of the whole study thing is is oh, it's, how do I word it it's biased Excuse yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely skewed. There's definitely Criminal. things that are <laughs> kind of all, all of the above, I guess. I And I, I guess I, I can't remember quite where I was going with my point. I'm sure it will come back to me as I as I think about it. But Well, you were talking about this, like he was basically... Um, it's similar to what you were talking paid. about with... Uh, yeah, so he, he himself wasn't paid, but a lot of these companies are paid and, and, and they, they do aim to profit. And, uh, 
and I, I think I think I was even listening to a Dr. Anthony Chafee podcast, and he was talking about a cancer patient. Um, I do remember where I was going with this, so I'll come back to it. Dr. Anthony Chafee was talking about a, a cancer patient going on full carnivore and moving from stage four terminal cancer to full carnivore diet and being cancer fully in remission in like 18, 19 months and was given like four months to live those four months full carnivore and then extended it and is now terminal terminal zero cancer remission. Like it's out. And so the thing I wanted to go back to about doctors, not it was doctors, not understanding, um, nutrition, nutrition and, and how it all impacts the gut. And more often than not, this, this scientist talks about how people like Dr. Saladino and all these other doctors that he has like a hit piece on, <laughs> essentially they're all psychologists. That's how they were trained. They're an MD psychologist yeah. that's now turned functional health coach or functional health doctor, functional doctor, functional yeah. medicine doctor, like mm -hmm. whatever terminology, but it's usually around functional medicine. And it, they usually come from a background of psychology. And I actually have a functional medicine doctor in Costa Rica, mm -hmm. where I used to live. And he has a background in psychology. But what he noticed is, all these people and patients coming to him with mental health issues. And he thought, how about I start taking some blood work and finding out what's going on inside their body and looking at that stuff and looking at what's going on in their gut. And if I can heal their gut, maybe their mental health conditions will yes. go away. And he started healing their gut and mental health problems went away. And it's like, Absolutely. Oh, maybe that's where functional, where these functional health docs that maybe they aren't a orthopedic surgeon or a stomach doctor and understand that whole thing. Maybe they get their nutritional background from looking at things from a mental health perspective and how they heal the gut in order to heal optimal human performance. I think that's naturally how it goes, but yeah. there's a lot of pushback in the industry and from doctors and from nurses and from health and wellness coaches that like, you should be listening to your doctor. You should yes. be going and getting a vaccine. You should be going and doing this. You should be doing that. And you shouldn't be listening to guys like Saladino, who's a psychologist who has no credibility in the nutritional world. But if you look at it from- You mean should not be listening to him? That's how people yeah. think we should think, not be yeah. listening to people like Saladino, who is a psychologist turned functional health, like carnivore MD- is his former name, I think. Um, but by being, by, you know, he's, he was able to recognize these patterns within himself mm -hmm. and how his mental health and how his gut microbiome was throwing off all these things within his own body that he's like, well, I'm not if I, if I fix my gut, well, maybe I can duplicate those results to other people. And, and that's science that's to me. People are like, that's just anecdotal. Well, what, at what point, how many tens of thousands of people do we need to see healed from autoimmune cancer, you know, all of these mm -hmm. like huge things and like, and like gut problems like SIBO and, um, the, the, any, any leaky gut related thing, all of these things that go away, how many tens of thousands before it's no longer anecdotal and it's become science. <laughs> Like to me, it becomes, we've crossed the point when you have so many people having the same results. Um, why does it have to be in a study that's that's paid for by people? It's not in their interest. It's not, you know, they're, they're not gonna pay for these studies because once you pay for these people to get healthy and then they're, they're, they're eating, now they're eating red meat and they're, um, they're not drinking alcohol. They've, they've, they don't need the, your pharmaceuticals anymore. The, the big food industry, what happens to them when we're no longer buying snacks? I don't buy snacks anymore, you know? So it's like, what do they do? It's gonna, it's money out of their pocket. So why are they gonna fund any type of study that takes money out of their own pocket, you know? And, mm -hmm. and all these industries are all in bed together. And I mean, it, this is right up my alley because like to me, mind, body, spirit, like you're talking about the functional doctors, they're like that, they're, they, it's holistic healing. It's, it's not just one thing. When one, if our mind is out of whack, our, we're all out of balance. Body, same thing. Spirit, we have to be in balance emotionally too. All of this stuff is all connected. 
So we, and that's what a functional doctor, that's what they do. You know, they, they, they know that it's all let food be thy medicine, you know, and that's something Mm -hmm. like, why isn't, why aren't doctors trained in medical school on nutrition, but like one, like it's a quarter, like, like, it's like a very, like Dr. Ken Berry said, it was like a very small folder that he had on nutrition. And by the way, none of it was even true. He, like he broke out of the matrix and now he teaches the exact opposite of what he was trained because it healed him. He was really overweight, had all kinds of problems, had skin issues, skin tags, all these weird things, almost diabetic, and then went carnivore. And now he's like, all of his problems, same, same story. And he's a doctor. And he said he noticed his patients while he's giving them um, diet advice. They're looking at his belly hanging over his belt going, OK, doc, yeah, I'm not going to take advice from you. <laughs> you know, that was before he went carnivore, of course, before he mm-hmm. knew better. And um, he was you know, trying to eat the standard American diet. The yeah. sad. I mean, it's, it's, it's very sad. Uh, well, it is also the um, acronym for standard American diet is sad. <laughs> Just ironically. It makes, makes a lot of sense. But I have taken up so much of your time. We could probably, we, we could talk all night. I already know that. Um, but I, this has been hopefully very enlightening to some people. I am going to throw some links underneath here. Uh, if anyone cares to research further on their own, don't listen to us. We're just telling you our personal experiences. You know, this is just what helped us. What turned our lives around is no alcohol and eating uh, optimally. Yep. The, the proper human so. diet is what Dr. Ken Berry calls it. The proper mm-hmm. human diet, you know, and it's, God, I just feel so good lately. I used to, how do we keep this to ourselves? We can't. We got to tell people whether it pisses all, people I'm off all, or not. I'm all for sharing, sharing everything that I do in my life and and I share all of that with uh with the people that follow me and and those that uh I am able to chat to on on podcasts and 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 share with any anyone that is willing to listen I am I am here to share this is what's worked for me it's not to say it's going to work for you but right. I mean do do your own research before I started carnivore I did my own research Oh me too uh, bef- before Steve. I got sober I did my own research um I didn't do that <laughs> I I just I I just I think it's important to to do your own research when it comes to everything um in terms of you know choosing to get or not get an experimental uh in medical injection. Yeah. injection do your own research don't listen to what cbc or cnn or nbc or any of those jackasses say do your own research and source it from uh doctors who stand to lose something by speaking up so think think about the guys like robert malone and peter mccullough and all these doctors who have chosen to take a stand against something and potentially lose not only their credibility, but everything in their life. And if someone is still willing to to, uh, go against the norm and and share information, uh, even with the odds of losing their career and Mm -hmm. and potentially ruining their entire reputation as well as their family's reputation, know that that is probably someone that you can trust and that you maybe should research a little bit further. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've never really even said this on, um, I've lost friends over this, uh, but my mom, you know, I did have a, I get prophetic dreams and I did have a, a dream that she should not get vaccinated. Um, mm-hmm. she thought I was crazy. She didn't believe it, you know, but I've had prophetic dreams my whole life and they always, they're very different. They're warning dreams. They're always warning dreams and they're always very vivid and they always freaking happen. Um, so I was begging her not to get vaccinated, but she did anyway. And I was a wait and see person. I wasn't immediately like, I wasn't like, I'm not going to get vaccinated. I wasn't, I was a wait and see person. Cause I wasn't sure in the beginning, I didn't know. And, um, but then I, I, after that dream, I was like, oh, this isn't going to be good. And my mom did get vaccinated. And then, you know, the, how the story goes, she uh, died of, um, she had two different types of blood cancer pretty, pretty soon thereafter, but of course they're not relating it 
they're not really, you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, okay, she was so healthy. She, everything was so good. Oh, plus I had the dream, but let's not count that. Cause I'm just batshit crazy. Right. But still family members don't believe that it's related. And then I've had friends who are really, really mad at me for even insinuating there could be that connection. And I'm like, how can you not see that it's a possibility at least like, don't be mad at me for, um, going, wait a minute, you know, and, and then I, there's a lot of other stories I could tell about that with other people I know, but I'm, that's another show. <laughs> that's a, that's a different show. It's part of the, it's part of the breakout of the matrix thing. Yes. It, for yeah. Sure. But I, I would part say two. <laughs> part two, there is the, uh, the uptick in cancer in, in the uptick in turbo cancers, blood cancers mm -hmm. specifically, uh, where does the where does the spike and the jab go when it is put into our bodies? It, it goes into our blood. So where are we seeing the most uptick is in blood borne cancer, stuff like that. And also, also affected by the blood is, uh, people's hearts. And I can assure people that, that young people dying of strokes and heart attacks, like my father did was rare in 97. Mm -hmm. And it's, now it's when, all the it, time. when it, when it happens all the time, it's not a normal new coincidence coincidence. It's maybe something, and there's no way to prove that this is for sure. 100% that's happening, but you can't, I don't think you can count it out that this is a potential culprit. Uh, and, and you have to leave it in until we can deem with complete certainty that the, thing that goes in the arm is not, uh, is not a cause. I don't understand the trust the science thing because it re really, a, a large group of people never got these types of vaccines before. And so what science exactly were we trusting? That always confused me. Mm -hmm. and, and also science in and of itself is always questioning science. That's part of science is questioning science. So it's like, why aren't we allowed to ask questions? What's happening? That was, uh, that was a big, <laughs> big part for myself as well. So we don't have to dig into it. I'm, I'm sure that that alone will, you know, if it's not the sobriety thing or the carnivore thing, I'm sure the, I'm uh, sure we just finished off pissing everybody off. Now we've alienated pissed, everybody pissed everyone off. So, <laughs> well, we don't know anything. We're just throwing out our little personal experiences. And if this resonated with you, let, let us know if it didn't resonate with you. I'm sure you're going to let us know. <laughs> I'm sure. Please, please do let us yeah, know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and like, like we're saying, I don't have proof of anything. Um, but what I can tell you is when I was at the blood cancer unit with my mom, um, I did speak up to, cause I wasn't going to get vaccinated to go visit her. And this was back, you know, two years ago. And they said, you don't have to, are you frozen? Oh no, you were just being really still. They said, you don't have to. And the, none of the doctors weren't vaccinated and none of the nurses were vaccinated. And then they said, we have seen so much, uh, so much more. Blood. So none of them were vaccinated. And that's why I didn't have to. And my, my brother and everyone else, like they didn't ask any questions like that because they were all, they, they just assumed it. I don't even think they know like, oh no, no one in the step, nobody was vaccinated there because they knew better. So yeah. Um, that was interesting because I don't I don't know how that would have gone down if I wasn't allowed to visit my mom. But luckily, everyone at the blood cancer unit knew <laughs> not to get vaccinated. But they didn't speak out. You know, I, I, it's kind of like, why aren't you saying something until I ask? You know, I had to I had to ask and let them know my thoughts before they shared their thoughts. That's interesting. That mm -hmm. that doesn't feel right to me. Yeah, but I guess everyone's scared of losing their job, like you said earlier. Yeah. They don't speak yeah. up. And yeah. Losing your job is not the worst thing. I, I lost a lot of things over the over the course you of the did. pandemic. And, and uh, I would say that um, losing all the things that I lost was the best thing that has ever happened to me. So um, I love that. Yeah. It depends it's how you look at things. Optimism yeah. is a, is a beautiful thing. Mindsets, everything. Like I, I posted something earlier. It's like, there's a gift in everything if you're willing to look for it. And it, it was a meme that I didn't create, but that was my little caption above it. And it just reminds me perfectly of what you just said. There's a gift in everything. And sometimes that gift is grief. 
<laughs> you yep, know? it is. And, and grief can actually lead us to like, look at you, like living your optimal life because your dad died so young. It, you, you could take that and just be sad your whole life and be in the victim role, or you could be uh, turned into the victor of your own life, turn into your own hero. Exactly. Yep. So Feel on that note, way. on that note, I guess we should, let's say goodbye to the audience and thank you to anyone who's hung in there. We had a long conversation. And we appreciate you. And any comments you have to make are welcome, even if you don't like us. <laughs> we'll take it. Please, please share. <laughs> please share. And um, so I hope everybody enjoyed this and saying goodbye. Bye, everyone.